Well, this morning we're continuing our journey toward the nativity of Christ and looking at three important words, virtues, uh, that come to us in Holy Scripture and throughout the life of the church. We talk about peace and how the Lord's incarnation is peaceful and it brings peace. We talked about the Lord's incarnation in relationship to joy and how important joy is in our lives and how the incarnation brings joy because we are entering into the presence of God and now we have the presence of God with us all the time never leaving us or forsaking us so today I want to talk about another word and that's the word love probably the greatest of all of the virtues love is very important Love is something that we humans have as a unique thing to us in our relationship to one another. And that is because we're made in the image of God who also has the same love. The Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have a union of love that is the eternal love. That's the love that is from the beginning. Love, you might say, is eternal Love, you might say, is infinite. Love, you might say, is uncreated. Because God is love. The sad thing is, is that we humans, we have this problem, right? We want to love. We love to love. We enjoy loving. But we also have this other thing called pride and selfishness, right? that thing that, you know, we want to love, but we really just want to be loved more than anything, right? So it's hard for us to sometimes express that love because of this thing called selfishness and pride that sneaks into our hearts. And we start thinking about jealousy and I, I don't like this and I don't like that. And really, it's influenced from both our own weird desires that we came up with and also the temptation of the devil that comes to us. He tries to get us away from that pure love. Today we have, what a wonderful text we have, full of names, right? Names are so important to God. That's why we call God love. One of his names is love. You notice that today Jesus has two different names, right? Actually, he has many, many names, right? Our God is a God who has so many names because he can't be named. In early Jewish days, you know, they weren't allowed to say the name of God. They used another phrase in its place just so they wouldn't say his name. Because they were not allowed to say it. It was too holy. It was too beyond comprehension. It was too out of their minds. And I think that's why it trickles down to us today in the many, many, many names of God. That's because God encompasses all things as well. But the most important, I think, of all the aspects of God that we can meditate on for us is this idea of love. You know, Jesus' name, do you know what it means? The name Jesus literally means, it tells us right in the text today, right? It means Savior, the one who saves. His name in Hebrew was Joshua, Yeshua. Hmm? It came down to us in Greek, Jesus. But really it is the word Yeshua, Joshua in Hebrew. And it means the one who saves. The one who loves. The Savior is the one who loves. He cares. One of the characteristics of the Israeli people in their times was warring, battling, right? And you might say that that's the opposite of love, right? which would be hate, perhaps, to hate someone so badly that you want to kill them, right? That would be the opposite, I would think, of, of pure love, right? Well, during the times before Jesus came and all these names that you, we just read in our gospel lesson and in the names read in the epistle lesson, we see this long list of these forefathers and these patriarchs who we celebrate also today as the, the, the parents and parents of great-grandparents and great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents of Jesus. So, 
When we look at all these names, we see so many things. But one thing that we can see throughout them is Jesus, is Savior. It comes through all the names, right? Even in Abraham's time, he's called out of his land to come to a holy place that God gives him. He is a type of Christ, coming out of somewhere and going to somewhere else. Every single one of our fathers is really a type of Christ in some way. Joseph saves his brothers. Moses is a baby who saves his people, right? You have Abraham saving his brother Lot. The list goes on. Each of these great and famous names had in some way contributed to the love that God has for us and expresses that back to us, right, to remind us. That's why we read all these names. We read them so that we don't forget. We read them so that we keep the love that God had for us generation after generation after generation after generation. He didn't forget us. Always remembered us. And he always has us in his care and in his love. Love is very important. And we see that even in the simple way that God came to us, we see love, right? We see love between Mary and Joseph. We see love between Mary and this baby that is to be born. Leading up to this, there was a lot of trial and a lot of difficulty to get to Jesus being on the earth. You know that when John was born, Herod thought that this was going to be the Messiah, so he had many, many children killed to try to find John. Elizabeth escaped to the wilderness and bore John, and he lived in the wilderness and prepared the way for the Lord so that the Lord would come to us. But Mary also, in her experience of pregnancy, had to run also away to the wilderness of Egypt because Herod again was trying to kill the baby. Imagine you coming into the world and thousands of people had to die for you to be able to come into the world. This is because the evil one was at a constant battle to stop the Savior. We see it throughout history, and one of the points I want to make today, as I've been studying a little bit about the Sumerian people and the Assyrian people, who were the foes and the adversaries of the people of Israel for much of their lifetime. There was a, the most powerful king probably in all of history in that time called Sennacherib. He was such a powerful king that he expanded his empire beyond any other king of the time. And you know what's called the Fertile Crescent? Perhaps you've heard that term. That's the crescent that goes from the Persian Gulf all the way up to Turkey and back down to Egypt. And it was a great crescent of fertility. That means food and plants could be grown easily. And Sennacherib, who was the Assyrian king at the time, had such a vicious uh, way about him <laughs> that when he went in to take a territory of people, he just wiped out everybody in his path and would just kill everyone. Or he would take them all captives back to his uh, city and then train them to become like his people. This happened to the people of Israel because they were taken by a later uh, king from Babylon who was of the same uh, group and family line of people. But the pain and the suffering that the world endured because of these Assyrians was unbelievable. At one point on this siege when he was taking over the known world, Sennacherib made it all the way down to Israel. And there he came to a city and they knew he was coming. You could see it as a cloud in the distance because there were hundreds of thousands of troops, more than any other army. And when he got to Lagash in Israel, they would siege it, which means they would camp outside the city walls or outside the gates of wherever this was 
and they would slowly dig away at the walls or slowly build a ramp so they could get in. And then they would just overtake them. In Lagash, they did this in Israel. This is one of the cities of, uh, of Israel, and they, they took it over. And Sennacherib was then going to Jerusalem to try to take Jerusalem. And all the other cities in his wake had been taken. But Sennacherib went to Jerusalem and was going to do the same thing. Long story short, Hezekiah prayed to God. He was the king, and he's mentioned today in our uh, genealogy list, King Hezekiah. He prayed to God, tried to appease Sennacherib. When that didn't work, he went to long, long prayer. And what happened was, the next day, all of Sennacherib's army were somehow sick. And they couldn't fight. We're talking thousands, hundreds of thousands of them. And with their tail between their legs, they went back home. And the writers of the history tell us that they didn't even want to write about it. They were so embarrassed that this great and powerful king of all the region had to run back because all his troops, you know, got sick. They were better. They got better when they got back and everything was fine. So God plagued them. God afflicted them. And why? Because God loved us. And he had to provide a savior. If Israel would have been wiped out like Sennacherib was doing to many of the people in the region, there would have been no Jesus. Because Jesus was to come through his chosen people. So it shows you how much love God has for us. He will stop armies. Look today at all those who suffered on the way, right? As the reader read today in Hebrews, talked about by faith Moses, by faith Joseph, by faith Gideon, all of these men and women also loved God deeply. And they were looking for this special Savior that would come. They looked with their lives. They endured so many things. They endured trials and scourgings, it says. Chains and imprisonment. They were stoned and sawn in two. And they were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world really was not worthy of, the writer says, right? They were such precious people, willing to give their whole being for this Savior who was to come. But it says, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Even though they waited for it and waited for it, they didn't get to see it. We know only really of one, right? St. Simeon got to see Jesus. But all those previous gave up their lives and gave up who they were many times so that Jesus could come into the world. Brothers and sisters, this is what love is about. Love goes even beyond our local times, right? We have to think of the future of our generations. This is what these great fathers did for us. They thought and considered the future generations that were to come. So what's that mean for us? It means that we have to example and live it today so that our children will see it and they will live the same faith. We have strong, strong defenses in the Orthodox Church, don't we? We have many, many great saints who stood up for the faith, to stand up for what they believe in. Israel did the same thing, you know. All the other peoples of the area had many gods. But Israel said, no, there's only one. And when they said that there was only one, the other people couldn't understand it. They didn't respect any of their gods. There's only one God. And this one God, brothers and sisters, is the God of love. We argue that all the other gods in the world were not gods of love. And very, very few of them are even mentioned in that way. The understanding of love is deep. You know, there are five words for love in the Greek language. In our language, we have one. 
right? We love hamburgers. We love working. We love walking. We love our wife. We love God. We all use the same word, right? It's a little confusing. But in Greek, there were five different five different words. The primary word that I want you to know today is the word agape. And agape is the Greek word that means unconditional love. It means you love without any strings attached. It means that you love just because you do. And there's nothing that anyone can do to change that love. Right? That's unconditional love. This is the love that God has for us. The other words for love are, of course, eros and phileo. Phileo means brotherly love. Eros means erotic, physical love. And then there's storgy, which means familial love, the love of your family. And we have all these loves. But the unconditional love of God is the one that attracts us most. Because we see that no matter what we do, no matter what we say, no matter how we live, even if we totally, utterly reject God, He still loves us. He wants us to love Him, but He loves us even if we don't love Him. And we have to example that same thing in our own lives to each other. We have to love each other sometimes when we don't want to, right? Brothers and sisters, sometimes family, Sometimes you get upset and you don't want to love. But deep down, you do. Brothers and sisters, Jesus has given us great love. He's shown this love. And God the Father has given it to us. As we say in liturgy, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. This is God's love for us, brothers and sisters. Let's remember it. Let's fellowship together as we approach Holy Nativity of Christ, who is our love, our incarnate love, became real love so we could see it and live it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory be forever.